I'd like to start off tonight though with, with, a, with a simple question that is easy to ask and hard to answer. What is love? Anybody know? What is love? Jif peanut butter? It's hard to beat that. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> Unless you're allergic to peanuts, then it's kind of a love-hate relationship. <laughs> what is love? Okay. Can you tell us a little more about the feeling? Okay, can you give us a little more on that? So uh, for those of you, I don't know if everybody has great hearing, so I'll just kind of repeat things. Uh, Sandra started off saying that love was a feeling, um, as can be established between two people, or between maybe a person and a thing, so on and so forth. And then Todd said love is, uh, love is also an action. Uh, and then he brought up the example of Jesus, um, obviously what he did and, and, and dying for us, but also uh, the great greatest commandment and how that kind of comes in with that. Uh, did I miss anything on what you said? Kind of got it. We are commanded to follow his example. I forgot that part. Sorry. <laughs> Anybody else? What is love? So what Bob said is, is uh, God knows love most in that he gave Jesus. Anybody else? Let me follow that question up with another question. So how do you know, how do you know what... Um, that that love is that thing, Sandy. Let's start with you since you answered first. How do you know that love is a feeling? How do you how do you know that? Mm -hmm. Okay, you experience basically. Okay, Todd. How do you know that that's love? Mm -hmm. So if you were to say, if I were to say, ah, I don't believe in the Bible, what would you say about? About that, do you have something like to work around that, or not really? Okay. <laughs> Gold star. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. For those of you who didn't hear, Todd was talking about the way that um, he's always found it difficult talking to people who don't uh, who don't operate from the from the baseline that the that we believe the Bible. So for people who don't don't believe in the Bible, don't believe in God, it's hard to have that you know have some kind of a middle ground there. So whenever you're talking about love, there's there's going to be some some popular definitions that are used in the culture by and large. The first one uh, is actually the one that Sandy said: uh, love is a feeling. This is a very common one that you hear. Um, I mean, if you just look at the news, <laughs> you see a lot of people saying this. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it got to be real popular, p people saying love is love, right? Um, have you guys ever heard people say that? 
the idea there is is that, that any any loving relationship is okay as long as you know i mean love is love it's all it's all the same it's all the same basically that there's no um you can't discredit somebody else's uh love because it's maybe immoral or whatever um that they're all kind of kind of equal so then the obvious problem with the whole love is love argument <laughs> that I think all of us saw was if all love is equal, well, then that would kind of mean that, you know, love between an adult and a child would be okay too. Like you can't, you can't say love is love when there you are acknowledging no, it would be wrong for an adult to be with a child. So you're already acknowledging that love isn't always just love. You see what I mean? There's, there is boundaries to a love. So you can't just say it's, it's, it's for whatever. And then that brings us to the problem of what happens when you fall out of love. As a pastor, I've actually heard this numerous times uh, over and over again. We don't love each other anymore. We, you know, we just fell out of love. What does that, what does that mean? I always ask. I'm like, well, it, I, the, the feeling has gone. And I say, well, is that all it was? Just a feeling like there's no connection whatsoever? So I, what? It's also a choice. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I 100% agree. And, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so love is a feeling, but it's not only a feeling. And I would even say that love isn't, how to say this, isn't restricted by a feeling. In other words, love can exist both before and after a feeling. Make sense? So it's not that love isn't a feeling. It is a feeling. But it's just more than that. And I think that's why there's so many different poets and musicians and stuff who spend so much time trying to talk about love because it's one of those things that's just hard. The second popular definition is acceptance. You actually hear this all the time. If, if you love me, you're going to accept me. And what that translates to, wh see, when I was a kid, acceptance and tolerance was more like, okay, well, we don't see eye to eye on this. But that's okay. We can still be friends. We can still talk rationally. and that kind of Well, things have kind of changed in more recent years. Acceptance more means blind support. Whatever it is, I have to just get behind it. And I don't really know um, how else to say that. It, it, you are not only supporting them, you're condoning them. Whatever it is, if you truly love them, you're going to condone them on whatever it is. So the problems here are obvious. Um, that means, hey, there's really no morality. Because at the end of the day, it's however you feel is however, that's just how it is. Like, you feel a certain way, then that's completely valid, and I have to condone that. And so if something is immoral, it doesn't really matter because that's how they genuinely feel. And we live in a day where, where feelings really judge everything in life. As long as I feel something, it is true. I don't have to worry about what is true. I have to worry about what my truth is. Um, so th there's no morality. Um, there's n really no room for diversity of opinions because that basically means whatever your opinion is, I have to support you on your opinion. But the question is obvious that I'm sure all of you are seeing. Why should I have to support your opinion of something instead of you supporting mine? Like, what's the ground here? Like, you're saying, hey, this is okay for me to be in this relationship. And I'm saying, no, you're not. So one of us has to cave to the other one. Who gets preference and why? So you have a little bit of a, I guess you could say, a philosophical conundrum. Um, another thing is, is it's kind of hypocritical to say that love is acceptance because you're judging somebody else who's not accepting, you're not accepting somebody else who's not accepting your view. So it's kind of hypocritical. <laughs> it's kind of an argument, <laughs> I mean, a, a circular uh, rabbit hole. Um, another thing is it's kind of short-sighted. How, how do you know that you aren't wrong? If you love me, you'll accept me. Well, how, how, how do you know you aren't wrong? Have you ever changed your mind about something in your whole life ever before? So is it possible that maybe you could be wrong? So love really can't be acceptance. It has to be more than that. I think that when, when it truly is love, there is acceptance, but not necessarily acceptance blindly. Like, right, it's like, let me put it like this. God accepts us. He takes us from wherever we are. Whatever our background, whatever our history, it doesn't matter. He takes us wherever we are. But does he leave us there? 
but he loves us. Shouldn't he just love us where we are and just leave us there? You see the argument? It just doesn't really make sense. God loves us, yes. He accepts us wherever we are, but then he works in us and grows us. So the third popular definition that you're going to hear a lot is that love is basically being nice. That, that's, that's it. So if you really love me, you're going to be nice to me. And what this translates to isn't necessarily that someone was rude to you so much as you you didn't, um, they said something that you didn't agree with, and that was, in a sense, rude. So in, under this definition, love would then be no judgment whatsoever. But <laughs> the ironic thing about somebody saying, hey, if you love me, you can't judge me. If God loves me, he won't judge me, is you have just made a judgment that that person judged you. See what I mean? It is impossible to not judge. <laughs> and try it. Like, if you never judge anything at all in your life, it's just, it's just not possible. Everybody, you're judging everything all the time. You're judging, hey, is this food still good? <laughs> it's been in the fridge about two weeks. Questionable. You smell it and you're like, mm, nope. <laughs> but then we also make other ju judgments, right? Like, hey, I'm going to work at this job. Is this a good job? Am I going to be able to, li to work here? Is this something I can do? We're, making, we're always making judgment calls, right? So I, I see somebody who is a convicted uh, uh, child molester. And I'm going to say, hey, can you watch my kids on Friday? Well, no, I'm making a judgment call. Everybody makes judgment calls all the time. Uh, you can know that uh, the Dallas, uh, the Houston uh, Cowboys, the uh, Dallas Cowboys, uh, they're just not a good team. Objectively, you can <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> when Danny's here. <laughs> I kid, I kid. Uh, so, you know, with, with being nice, there's really three areas. Being nice means no judgment. Oh, sorry, no judgment. It means uh, the tone of your voice. And it means uh, you cannot disagree or correct me at all. And so those things are kind of narrow. Because if someone says, I already mentioned this, if someone says, hey, you're being judgmental, they are making a judgment call about you being judgmental. It's kind of, they're self-refuting. The next thing is, um, when somebody says you're not being loving because your tone of voice, that is usually true. That is usually true. We, there's a lot of things that we can learn to say in a nicer way. <laughs> we don't have to say them as rudely and abrasively as possible. But that's more of something that takes time. I think sometimes we're so concerned that people are going to give us blowback that we just kind of hop the gun. <laughs> and then the last thing I said that love, ha you have to be, you, have to, you cannot correct, there, there can't be any disagreement. Um, it isn't hateful to disagree with somebody. So love, you know, is being nice. Okay, I don't really, I don't really agree, but being nice doesn't mean that I am agreeing with everything. It's not hateful to disagree with somebody. That's that's not hateful, and I, I think that it takes a level of maturity to get there, to where you aren't always on your guard about that kind of stuff. So, so I was, I was doing church. I was doing doing this ministry, this young adult ministry, and there was this girl that was coming, and this was the basic idea of her of her belief system. She said this, God is love. Okay, so I'm with you so far. God is love. So then she said, since God is love, so now she's going to draw her application here. Since God is love, that means that all will be saved. Everybody's going to be saved because a good God who loves wouldn't possibly send anybody to hell. I'm sure you guys have heard something very similar. <laughs> this is not a new idea. This is not, not at all, but there's, there's four basic ideas about her argument that I want to kind of bring out. First off, when she said this whole God is love, so that therefore all will be saved, she used her definition of love. So she defined love herself, not, not based off the Bible or anything. In her mind, this is what qualifies as love. You have to blindly support this person and there can be no boundaries they just get to live in this la la land of, of rainbows and butterflies that's her definition of love and that's fine you can define things yourself but just because you define it yourself doesn't mean that that's how it is okay i can define roswell as a, a car that doesn't mean that it's not a city you see what i mean it, it doesn't matter how i choose to redefine something it doesn't change what it is um so so she used her own definition of love instead of well 
what about God's definition of love, though? So rather than, you know, this is God's definition of love and then kind of weighing her heart against it, she just said, no, this is my definition of love. God has to conform to this definition of love if he is loving. Now, God, God doesn't have a measure of love. We think of it like this. We think of it as buckets. Everybody has a bucket, right? And in your bucket, you have a little bit of patience, however much. Some people are more, more patient than other people. You have a little bit of, of love in this bucket, however much. Some people are more loving. In this bucket over here, you have uh, maybe um, generosity. So in all your different buckets, you have different things. And we think of God as the same thing. You know, okay, so God has a measure of love. And when he runs out of love, he just runs out of love for you. But God is love. He doesn't have a measure of love. He is love. That means when he does something that seems unloving, there is something wrong in me that needs to change. And this is where it gets hard because you have to actually submit to what the Bible says. And that's going to be a struggle because you're going to read things in the Bible that God did, and you're not going to like it. If you don't ever read anything in the Bible that you don't like, you're not paying attention. There's a lot of things in there that happen <laughs> that you shouldn't like. It's one of those things that challenges our spirit. The second thing is that for her basic idea that if God is love, all will be saved, the idea is this, that sin is okay. It's not really a big deal. Sin is not, is not a big deal. It doesn't really matter uh, you know, what's right or wrong. It's all kind of relative. The third problem with her argument is that it kind of had the idea that God is only love. See what I mean? That he's not anything else. But that's not true. God's also jealous, right? He, he's not cool with people worshiping him and other people do. Like he's not, he's not cool with that. Um, so God isn't only love. Yes, he is love, but that doesn't mean that that's all he is. His entire essence can't be reduced to simple, a simple, you know, Webster's dic uh, dictionary definition. And God isn't only a force of love. He's not some spark out there in the universe. It's just this love bubble that comes and, you know, whatever. He's a, he's a person. And then the fourth problem with this is that her definition of love basically meant no boundaries. Love without boundaries. Let's, let's take that apart and say, okay, do we actually believe in love without boundaries? Some people say yes. If you truly love somebody, there can be no boundaries. You, you, you are patient, you accept, you're kind, and all these different things. Let's, let's take two human examples. The first example is adultery. So you love your spouse. I, if you're married, I, I hope that you do. <laughs> I, I hope. <laughs> and uh, so, so you love them, and they cheat on you. Oh, no, that's cool. Because I love them, it's okay if they... No, 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 no. Like, it doesn't matter how much I love Gracie, I don't want her with another man or woman. I don't really, I don't really want that. I don't like to share my love. Like, this is, this is my thing I got going on. Like, this is not for anybody else. I mean, Todd, I'm sure you feel the exact same way. Rick, I'm sure you feel the exact same way. Love isn't something you just, like, spread around, like, hey, let's all take a sip and pass it around. It's, it's, not, it's not a party night, you know. Um, so right there, we know right there love has some sort of boundaries, and that's a good thing. Love should have boundaries. This, this naive idea that God, to love me, can't have any boundaries, it doesn't work in the real world. Another example, you love your kids, right, but you don't let them get away with anything or everything. Like, there is some form of, no, you cannot do this. Or there should be. I mean, maybe maybe at your house everything's just crazy all the time. But well, my house is crazy all the time, anyways. Uh, so uh, just a couple of verses that I think kind of shed some light on this. First John five two through three says this: This is how we know that we love God's children when we love God and obey His commands. For this is what love for God is: to keep His commands. And his commands are not burdensome. So right there, we got a pretty good idea. So in order to love God, we have to be loving people. And to really love God, we have to obey him. Well, there's a lot of people nowadays talking about how God doesn't really love me and all this different stuff. Not really a conversation is, 
do I really love God? Because sometimes we like the idea of a God, but we don't really like the God who actually revealed himself. And he says, yo, this is what I'm actually like. Well, I don't like that. I'd rather go with the God in my heart. You hear people say this when they say, well, the God of the Old Testament. It's the same God as the God of the New Testament. Nothing changed. (laughs) Exact same guy. That's that guy. So, you know, hey, God has to love unconditionally. Well, yes, and he does love unconditionally, but just because he loves unconditionally doesn't mean that there are no consequences for our actions. I love my kids, but I still punish them. Fact. He loves us enough to let us choose whether to follow him or not. Okay, so now that we've kind of gotten a basic idea of love, let's kind of look at, because remember, we're talking about godly conflict, us being in conflict with other people. Now that we've kind of looked at all this depth and complexity, we can safely say love is way bigger than a simple definition. I still don't have, you notice I didn't give you any definitions of this is love, because it's hard. You can't just, like, I kind of gave you guys a, a trick question. There was no right answer to it, because you can't really define love. It's, just, it's a big concept. <laughs> so in, in uh, 1 John 3.16, it says this. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also, he being Jesus, we should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So love, if we had to say in this context, one aspect of love that should be dominant in our lives is that love is at least in part, a large part, laying down your life for others. This, once again, is not the definition of love. Don't, don't say this was the definition I gave you. This is an aspect of love. Love is... Is has to be, at least in part, laying down our life for others. So, so let's apply this to different areas. My spouse. Am I laying down my life for my spouse? See, we, we read the Bible sometimes, and I, and I think that we fail to kind of see how it applies. And we kind of pick out the verses that fit a certain occasion that we like. And then the other ones, we just don't really see how they apply, so we just kind of push them to the side. So if love is laying down my life for others, what does that mean for how I should treat my kids? Am I laying down my life for my kids? It's easy to tell your kids what to do. It's hard to lay your life down for them. And I'm not saying let them run the roost. That's not what I'm saying. Love is laying down your life for others with your leaders. Boy, I tell you, at least with the government, I have a hard time with this. (laughs) I have a hard time with this guys. Uh, I find it's a lot easier to nitpick what government officials are doing than actually pray for them, which is ironic because the Bible never once says nitpick your immoral government leaders. <laughs> it always says pray for them. So, I mean, it's a cold, different attitude that goes with that and a very difficult attitude. And this is one of those, I'm always honest with you guys when I struggle with something. This is something I struggle with. And we have leaders everywhere in our life. We have leaders in our church. We have leaders in in the government. We have leaders in our house. We can't get away from it. But we have to love our leaders in the sense of laying down our life for them. Um, Laying down our life for others in the sense of congregants, each other. Are we laying down our life for each other? These are things that um, I think really become game changers. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. He did something that set the model for us. So that we can know when we are doing something that is loving or not loving based off of the example that he gave us. Then we go to 1 Corinthians 13. If you guys have ever been to a 20-something getting married, you've, got, you've gone to their, to their, uh, to their wedding, and they're, they're in their early 20s, you're going to see this somewhere on the walls, somewhere. I don't know, I don't know where, but it's going to be there. Not every time, but a lot of the time. Okay, if I speak, uh, if I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 
if I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions and if I give over my body in order to boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. That sheds a lot of light on the prophets of the Old Testament and how they prophesied. They weren't just yelling at people. They actually loved. That sheds a lot of uh, light on Jesus when he was dying on the cross. So before this section in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit in chapter 12. And then after this chapter, he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit again in chapter 14. So that brings up the question, well, what does this have to do with the gifts of the Spirit? Have you ever been in a church that there are people who gave words, I'm using that in quotations, words, but they were just not nice people? When they gave words, there's more of them beating people over the head. Have you ever been in there? I, I've been to churches like that. I have. Uh, I've, I've had people pull me aside to give me a word and, you know, had nothing to do with, with anything. I couldn't make sense of it one way or another. And then after he gave it, he went like this, poof. Is there a chill in here? Like, having a shiver down your spine isn't the Holy Spirit. Having a changed heart is the Holy Spirit. Go read through the Bible and see how many times people got the shivers and shakes and it was the Holy Spirit. And then go and read in there and see how many times the lives were changed and it was the Holy Spirit. There's a big difference between getting worked up in here and actually encountering the Holy Spirit. So, you know, just because somebody says that it's a word from God doesn't mean you have to believe that it is. Is it biblical? Does it match up with the Bible? Does it actually fit your life? When they say, oh, this season's going to end, and you're like, what are you talking about? I'm having a great time. Like, <laughs> I'm not in a bad season. This isn't a season of trial for me. <laughs> this is a great time in my life. And uh, so love is laying down your life for others. And uh, when we're talking about the Holy Spirit here, if Paul interrupted his discussion of the gifts of the Spirit to talk about love, this is something we can deduce. More, it is more important um, how we do something than what we do. If I do something really stupid, but I'm trying to do something right, God's going to honor that a lot more than if I'm setting out to do something really stupid. You see what I mean? It's not doing the same because the heart's different. And God always goes to the heart over the action. Compare King David with some of these other kings. King David had a lot of pretty jacked up stuff. And yet, he was a man after God's own heart. And some of these other guys weren't. And so what we see, another thing that we see is, is as we compare this with, with the words, of the, with gifts of the Spirit, people, we as people, we like rituals, but God likes heart. We like to do things in perpetuity, over and over and over again. Something for the rest of our life. I like to go to church every Sunday. Why? I just like to do it. I like to do this every, every week. I like to do this. And we like to get our little schedules. This is my ritual that I like doing. It's a lot harder to do with the right heart. It was easy for me to go sing songs every week, being the worship leader. That was super easy. I never had a problem with that. But it's hard to lead worship. See what I mean? Because now it's not just me singing a song and having a good old time playing my guitar. It's me meaning something. There's two kinds of musicians out there, and I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. Those who say something and those who say something. You know what I mean? You can listen to a musician playing, and you think, wow, that was just, that was flat. You're hitting all the right notes, it just doesn't mean anything. You don't mean the words you're saying. You know what I mean? And uh, that's, that's easy to do, but it's hard to sing and lead worship in a way that is like from your heart and you're being genuine. That's, that's hard. It's easier, at least it was for me, it's easier for me to focus on am I hitting the right notes? What do people think of the music? Is my guitar playing distracting or is it cohesive? See, I mean, those are all the things that was easy for me to focus on. It was hard for me to focus on people. And that's because we like rituals, but God likes art. So just uh, before I move on here to the next section here, you know, whenever people say I'm spirit-filled, look at, look at the evidence. Look at the evidence. Are they rude, arrogant, foolish? They're not filled with the Holy Spirit. See what I mean? 
you can you can judge uh, you can judge a tree from the fruit that it produces. You can do that. And if you got somebody who's just a snide, derisive person, divisive person, no, that's not how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit doesn't work in disunity; He works in unity. I've been to churches where everybody was at each other's throat, and then they said, "Why isn't the Holy Spirit moving?" Well, I have a couple ideas. Maybe try forgiving each other. Try getting along. And you'd be surprised how it just changes the whole atmosphere. You can tell when a church is bickering and when they're not. So, um, remember that it doesn't amount to anything if there is no love. Why I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, if there is no love, it doesn't amount to anything. We literally just read that. You can tell by the fruit that something produces. Spirit, The Holy Spirit changes us. And if you paid attention to the things that Paul mentioned, he mentioned prophecy. I have a word literally from God. Knowledge. I have something to teach you. Uh, sacrifice. I have laid down myself. Look at me. Generosity. And then he said it's all just noise. Has no profit without love. That's crazy. That is crazy. Because we focus on the ritual. I, I did all the right things. And God doesn't care about us doing the right things. He has, cares about the heart. He looks way deeper within. And that's, ooh, that's harder. It's easier to fake things. So then you get to chapter, uh, I mean, sorry, verse 4, and it says this, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Now, let me just stop, because right now we've all gotten our cap on. Right now we're thinking about marriage, because that's how those, these verses have been used. But these verses are actually talking about the church getting along with each other. Specifically, people who are spirit-filled and people who are not spirit-filled. Jews and Greeks, older and younger. There's a lot of different conflicts there. Men and women. If you go through Corinthians, basically everybody was fighting with everybody. <laughs> so j let me just summarize. Everybody didn't like everybody. And so this, this is what he has to say. He's brought correction. He's taught them about the Holy Spirit. And I'm just going to take a time out. We're going to talk about love now. Love is patient. Are you being patient with one another? Love is kind. Are you being kind towards one another? Because if there's one thing I know, it's that when we say that we're spirit-filled, it's really easy to start chewing other pe people apart. It's okay because I've got the Holy Spirit, so I can start laying into you because I've got this divine you know, discernment. And that's not really how the Holy Spirit works. And so we say it's okay for me to do this because I've got the spirit of discernment so I can act ugly. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It is not boastful. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not irritable. Is this how you're acting towards one another in the church? It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Oh, oh, that one's hard, guys. That one hurts more than all the other ones put together. Because I do keep records of wrongs. I, I don't know if you guys ever struggle with this, but I, I do. I, I have a really hard time letting go of wrongs. I kind of prioritize people. Like, okay, this person is more likely to hurt me than this person. So I'm not going to go hang out with this person. I'm going to hang out with this person. Do you ever do that? Don't look at me like I'm some kind of bad person. You do it too. I just haven't caught you yet. Uh, love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. That means whether I'm the cause of the unrighteousness or you're the cause of unrighteousness, I'm not getting getting joy out of that. Like, haha, they messed up. They finally got caught. Really? Definitely not the right attitude to have. So when you read through this section, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And then he goes on, uh, but we're just going to stop right there. Because uh, that's the more popular bit. Uh, as you read this, ask yourself, do I have love for one another, for the church, for, ki for my kids, for my spouse? Do I have this definition of love? Because, once again, he didn't give us a definition of love there. He gave us more pieces to the puzzle. Are you treating them with patience? Are you being kind? Are you bearing them? Because that's, that's hard. I'm, I'm okay with loving my wife until I have to carry her. Then I'm not so into it. I'm like, hey, you need to pull your own weight around here, okay? I'm a pastor. I got big, important stuff going on. Have you, haven't you ever done something stupid like that? Come on. You guys keep looking at me like, am I not supposed to tell you about my struggles? I mean, oh, I have it all together. 
<laughs> Matthew 5, 44 through 46 says, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. In other words, God also does this. Do this so that you can do as your Father does. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, evil person and the good person, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Once again, righteous person and the unrighteous person. Uh, For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? So we're seeing that love also involves not cursing somebody. And we mean that in a lot of different senses. Using curse words, uh, praying that something bad or or wanting something bad to happen to them, um, and then also more of the Wiccan witchcraft kind of thing of putting spells on somebody. There's a lot of different ranges that this applies to. Um, Not cursing others, uh, not despising people, not wishing them harm, not giving physical blows, these kinds of things. Then we get to 1 Peter 2, 21, and I hope you're getting a good idea of what is love because we're talking about conflict, dealing with conflict with one another. One of the big parts of conflict is love. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23, For you were called to this, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, that you should follow in his steps. He did not commit sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And then we get to chapter 3, verse 9. Not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing. Since you were called for this, so that you may inherit a blessing. We were called to give a blessing. So that kind of summarizes our response to attacks. And if you are dealing with conflict with somebody, you are being mistreated, somebody is being ugly with you, I want to encourage you 100% to read 1 Peter three times all the way through. This is how you do that. Set aside a chunk of time, 30 minutes to 45 minutes. I don't know how long you read people, maybe an hour. If you're as slow as my dad in reading, it might be about two hours. It, my dad's a really slow reader. So wherever you are in there, set the time aside. Start at the beginning. Do not get up until you reach the end. Don't check your phone. Don't check any. Follow the argument that he's making. Then put it down. The next day, do the exact same thing all over again. And then the third day, do the exact same thing. When you do that, you're going to really start to pick up on what he's saying. 1 Timothy uh, 3 3 says, Not an excessive drinker, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. We have a lot of ideas of what it means to be a man. But it's, it's surprising how many times that the Bible says that men are supposed to be gentle and kind. Oof. Ephesians 4 31 through 32. Let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting, and slander be removed from you, along with all malice. The malice would be like intending harm on somebody. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. So even if they are wrong, you're still trying to do what's right. And I think that's hard. That's the hardest because what we do is we look to see if we're justified. And God help us when we are justified because of this. When you think, When you think you are justified, that's when you have a choice to make. When you think you're justified, you you have to make a choice. You have to choose. Do you do what's right or what feels good? To do what's right, you've got to let it go. To do what feels good, you've got to rub it in. It's two completely opposite choices, and you have to make that choice. See, what we do is, I'm justified in this bad attitude, therefore I'm going to nurture this bad attitude, and that's just the way it's going to go. Well, just because they started it doesn't mean you have to match their stupid. You know what I mean? Like, they did something stupid, so I'm going to match it. Stupid for stupid. The Bible calls this returning evil for evil. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, our church, our, our church mission, the, the whole reason why we're here, the, the thing that guides everything that we do, Every ministry that we're going to do in the future as well is a very simple statement. Love God, love people. It starts off that way. Well, as Todd pointed out, if you love, you do. It's easy to say we love God, we love people. Does, do our actions show that? See what I mean? Because there's going to be times when you don't want to come to church. There's going to be times you don't want to serve people. Are you still going to do it? 
because we're, uh, the last part of our, of our, of our slogan, our, our mission, love God, love people, serve both well. Not just serve them, serve them both well. So love is, an, is a feeling and it also is an action that we have to act upon. Lord, we thank you for everything you're doing uh, in us and through us. Uh, we thank you for all the opportunities that are coming by for Roswell and for this church. God, we know that you have such a great future for us, uh, and that future is going to involve things like suffering and, and enduring and, and, and ha- going through hardships, but it's also going to involve seeing people getting saved. And so, Lord, we, we go through the trials knowing that, that there's a brighter day after the trials, a day where we get to see people come to know you. And, uh, God, even if only one comes, Lord, what, a, what, a, what an awesome reward and responsibility and, 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 and treasure to be able to be a part of somebody getting saved. So, Lord, I, I pray that you would work, work in us and, and change our hearts and help us as we move forward. Help us to have a clear vision and clear direction for you. And uh, we love you, Lord. Amen.